Okay. So here we got sheets of, of cells, kind of multiple nodules. Kind of some mucinous background that makes it look almost clear. Little tiny islands that look almost squamoid. Some ducts lined by kind of columnar or cuboidal cells filled with some secretion. Oh yes, true, I, I see the comment. Basal cell carcinoma in the setting of, of genodermatoses uh, like Gorlin syndrome. Yes, definitely you can see basal cells in kids um, in the setting of Gorlin syndrome. Here's some more ducts. And then what are these? What kind of structure are we looking at here? Anyone? You can type it in papillae, yeah. When you have little finger-like projections or micro papillae, technically, because we don't see the little uh, fibrovascular cores here, but you're right. They do look a little like orphan anti eyes. Okay. These little, uh, <clears throat> little floating islands obviously are papillae or micro papillae where the tips are cut off and floating in the space and we don't see the connection here. We can see the connection. Here we don't. So it's just a matter of tangential sectioning. And here, this is quite beautiful. Look at the secretion. It's all like a lava lamp or something. Really pretty. And then in these other areas are quite solid and they've got little tubules. So we've got solid nodules of relatively uniform epithelial cells, maybe a few mitoses, but pretty uniform cells, not real ugly. They've got some punctuated by tubules and ducts. And then we've got um, dilated um, cystic spaces that have papillae and, and or micro papillae protruding into the lumen. So we've got some takers here. We've got syringocyst adenoma papilliferum, tubulo papillary adenoma, which I think there's kind of two entities that really overlap closely, papillary eccrine adenoma and tubular apocrine adenoma. And in my mind, those two tumors get split out, but I feel like they have an awful lot of overlap. I kind of personally think of them as like kind of one entity. I don't know that everyone agrees with that, but in my mind, I think that they have so much overlap that it's hard to tell them apart. What else is in this differential? I haven't given you any clinical information. Look at these kind of squamoid islands or almost like squamoid morules, you know? Like, don't you get that in, like, I haven't done general surge bath for a long time, but in, in, in there's something in endometrial carcinoma, you get little like swirls of keratinocytes sometimes. Anything else? What if I told you, well, does anyone, does anyone have a guess of where on the body this is? With practice, you can begin to, to guess this. We've got a tumor embedded in really dense, dense regular collagen. And look at that. See how wavy that is? Those wavy collagen fibers? That tells me, what is this structure right here? What is this? And if you've seen one of my YouTube videos from January, you'll know. This is, is this a nerve or something else? Fascia, yes. This is either fascia, tendon, or ligament, okay? We don't see ligament that often unless you're doing bone pathology, but uh, tendon and fascia, dense regular connective tissue, looks like this. It's got dense collagen, bland spindle cells, but it has this tendency to bunch up like an accordion and get really, really wavy when, when we process the tissue. And my uh, fellow from a couple years ago, Ed Fulton, he, he said, this looks kind of like, when it gets real wavy, it looks like ramen noodles. When you take them out of the pack, the little, little dried ramen noodles, the super, super waviness of it um, makes you think of, uh, of ramen noodles. And when he said that, I was like, this is brilliant. So I made a video on YouTube if you, if you want more information on this. And I've, I've named it in his honor, the ramen noodle sign of Fulton, um, so, uh, so that he can always be remembered for his contributions. Look at that. Oh, uh, look at how ramenoid it looks. I really want a bowl of ramen right now, actually. Not instant ramen, like good stuff. Okay, so ramenoid, I, I coined that today, right here. We've got evidence now. Okay, and once we put it on YouTube, then I'll put a paper and I'll cite it, ramenoid and I'll cite the YouTube video. And this is how the world works today. Okay, so anyway, where are we gonna have, you know, fascia or tendon 
And then here's subcutis. How do I know this is subcutis? Because what's that? Yeah, there is fat, but you know, you can have fat next to tendon in the deep soft tissue of the body. But right here is the clue that even though no one's told me, I can tell we are right underneath the skin. We're in the subcutis because these are eccrine coils. Eccrine coils and ducts. When you see eccrine coils and fat this close to tendon or fascia, you're almost always in the actual skin, hands or feet. So you can usually use this to tell because you're gonna, because there's not really anywhere else in the body where the, the fascia and the tendons are that close to the skin and subcutis except in the hands and feet. Everywhere else, the fat layer is much thicker and you're not gonna be down anywhere near this big, thick bundles. So I think it's a really helpful clue when I see that dense regular connective tissue plus eccrine coils and fat right close to it, then I know I'm probably in the fingers, toes, hands, feet, wrist, ankle area. And the other clue is that oftentimes when a tumor gets taken out from acral sites, it's irregular. It's not a nice circumscribed lobule. It's got little ratty kind of rayed borders. And the reason for that is that it's got all this dense regular connective tissue, tendon, sheath, and fascia. And also because the hand surgeon is going to be very delicate and gonna try to remove the tissue without taking any extra normal tissue because there's not much normal tissue to spare in the hands and feet. So I feel like it doesn't always work, but when I see a nodule of stuff that doesn't have any epidermis over it, just a blob of, of lesion with a lot of dense connective tissue and frilled edges, I right away wonder if I'm from the hands or feet. I think that it works actually pretty well, not all the time, but it's a pretty useful little clue. And then, oh, someone said differential to hydradenoma papilliferum. That would also be um, uh, a thing to think of if we were in the anogenital area. But the one thing that no one's mentioned is the fact that we are actually in the finger of a middle-aged man. So now, what's this diagnosis? Changes everything. Oh, crap, part of the scan doesn't look very good. Let's go over here. Yes, very good. Roxana, this is digital papillary adenocarcinoma, formerly known as aggressive digital papillary adenocarcinoma, although the aggressive part got dropped a few years back uh, by most people. And this is a really, really important entity to note. It's relatively rare, um, but it usually doesn't particularly look malignant. Um, it's cytologically oftentimes is bland. I've seen exceptions that had really marked atypia and necrosis, but the majority of cases that I've seen, and I see this probably a few times a year in my practice um, because patients get referred for it, um, they, uh, they usually look very bland and benign. And in fact, a lot of times they're nicely circumscribed. I've seen some that infiltrate. This one was a little bit more infiltrative looking, but I've seen mo many of them are like nicely circumscribed, kind of encapsulated looking cystic lesions that have cystic spaces with papillae or micropapillae, and then also have solid spaces, usually which are punctuated by little tubules. Okay. Sorry, the, my, uh, internet is getting a little slow. Let's see if I can find another area like this. Solid area with tubules and then other area with papillae in the cystic space. That's the classic combination of those two things to make this diagnosis. Basically, any papillary um, adnexal lesion on the hands or feet, this is the diagnosis that you should think of before anything and everything else. And really, I would be hesitant to call it anything other than this unless you are an expert in this area or are shown an expert. I, I would be very worried. I have rarely seen some of the things that I thought ended up being maybe benign, but I'm in general, what we think is that anything with papillae on the hands and feet like this has a potential to metastasize. So in the old days, they subdivided this into uh, papillary adenocarcinoma and papillary adenoma based on if there were atypical features or not. But what we found in the end was that even the ones that looked benign had the potential to metastasize. And it's, I think about 25%, I can't remember, 20 to 30%, somewhere in that range of cases in, in one of the larger recent studies that metastasize and they can go to regional lymph nodes and also to the lungs. Um, most of the patients I've seen have actually done well, but I have I've seen cases that had distant metastases. So um, the, um, the other thing about them is that uh, they can be locally aggressive. So the, there are reports of patients needing to have an entire digit amputated. So obviously this is a, this is a problematic um, thing. They're usually more often in men and they're often in the digits of middle-aged uh, men is the most, the most common uh, thing. But basically anytime you see um, a sweat gland tumor or an adnexal tumor on the hands and feet, this entity should always be in your mind as could it be that because it's one of those things that's easy to miss if you don't think of it. 
and devastatingly bad potentially if you miss it. Okay, not always, but it can be really bad um, if you miss it. Um, and the when it's got nice papillae, that's great. But some cases have very um, a very sparse papillae and just have kind of cystic spaces and solid nodules. They can look very similar to hydradenoma sometimes. So I have seen hydradenomas on the hand and feet, but I always am very cautious and try to consider, is there any way it could be a digital papillary adenocarcinoma? Because there are solid variants that are pretty solid and only have a little bit of cystic change and don't have very many papillae. Um, one thing I find pretty helpful is this kind of sheet-like growth with little tubules in it. I feel like that is a, it's a kind of a look that this tumor has that you don't see as often in hydradenomas or other tumors. Um, and, uh, and sometimes it can even almost, it almost gives me a biphasic appearance that reminds me a touch of like synovial sarcoma or something. It sounds kind of crazy, but I don't know, it works for me visually. Maybe I've seen some where the, the cells get kind of oval and that have this very like streamy, very uniform oval look and then have these little tubule or gland-like spaces in them, which is similar to what you see like in a biphasic synovial sarcoma. So I don't know, I've seen ones where it made me think of that at least. So really important entity to know, they don't have to have atypia, they don't even have to have much in the way of mitoses um, to be malignant. If I see something with cysts and papillaries like this and it's on the hands or feet, I'm gonna almost always end up calling it digital papillary adenocarcinoma.